So my name is Bob Sierra. I'm a graduate fellow, as you mentioned. I'm really glad to be here to share my research. Thanks for coming. So um, I'm going to be talking about using uh, CFD, computational fluid dynamics, as a new tool for kind of studying the structure and function of the vertebrate respiratory system. So I use blue waters to build computational fluid dynamics of the reptile lungs. And I think a reasonable question is, but why? Why would I be doing that? Um, and a kind of motivation is to understand how complex physiology works and how does it evolve. So we have this idea of evolution. You might have seen something like, like this cartoon that gets repeated all the time where you have you know, uh, some ape ancestor really turning into a human. That looks like our goal here. Or Aristotle's scale in Natura where nature looks like it's organized with humans at the top. And this is not the way we think about evolution in biology now. Um, it's more a better diagram is something like this, where we have essentially a family tree of all organisms, and we're all here at the same time. And every, every organism has been evolving on Earth at the same amount of time. It's equally adapted for its environment. And by studying the form and function of these animals, we can reconstruct this evolutionary story and figure out why there are branches here. That's kind of the field I'm in. And to give you a sense of a complex, this, this is kind of a rendering of uh, the global biodiversity in terms of phylogenetic relationships. So all this stuff is, there's a lot of stuff. We're probably over there somewhere. It doesn't really matter. OK. And when we have those evolution relationships, we can then kind of make sense of form and, and function. So we have, a, for example, a bunch of arm um, skeletons here. And we can say, OK, there's bones in here that are all related. And we can find out a single origin for the design, but that also explain the variation in the design and what that might be for. So for example, you could look at the reconstruction of um, the evolution of the, uh, from a fin to a limb, going from fishes to land animals. And then you could say, OK, that common design has led to like a short, powerful uh, a limb in a bear and a long, a gracile, but very efficient and quick limb in a deer. So we're using blue waters to apply the same approach to breathing. And maybe you haven't thought about breathing very much, because you just do it all the time, and it seems pretty easy. Um, to breathe, you expand your chest. Uh, your ribs go up and down, your uh, diaphragm lowers, and it makes negative pressure. And this is kind of a latex cast of your lung, where the red and blue indicate the blood vessels that have been injected with latex, and the white is the air spaces. So the air spaces are really uh, entwined with that blood. And your lung expands and contracts, and that's how the air goes in and out. But if we look at the family tree of animals, breathing isn't quite so simple. Breathing, the breathing motions came out of fish irrigating their gills using uh, buccal oscillation. And then you have amphibians that, like frogs, that use their throats to, to ventilate. Um, higher up in the family tree, we start to get using ribs to breathe, uh, bring air in and out. And we have all some really specialized breathing uh, in different specialized lungs in mammals, reptiles, and birds. And that's kind of the distinction that we're going to be looking at. So our key question is, birds and mammals have really different pulmonary systems. And how do these different lungs work, and how do they evolve? Here's a good cartoon that explains how your lung works. Um, your lung expands and contracts. Air goes in all the way down your trachea to the end, the terminal airways. And it takes the exact same pathway back out. It's kind of like a hollow tree. We'll call that a tidal lung. And uh, the, pretty much all the lung looks the same. In contrast, the bird lung is really wacky and quite different. So the lung itself is a small part of the body right here that doesn't expand and contract. It stays rigid. And it consists of these tubes that run parallel, essentially, from back to front, where air always goes in the same direction, from the back of the lung to the front of the lung. And that is accomplished by um, these compliant air sacs that are kind of like bellows that sit outside of the lung. And this is a latex cast of a chicken. And this is the lung right here. All this is, um, is that, uh, those air sacs. And that's actually what makes bone, bird bones hollow. Um, so we have a t a really two different ways to approach breathing. We can have a one uh, lung that expands and contracts with tidal flow, or have a lung where we've separated the breathing and the circulation, and we've created unidirectional flow. Uh, just a brief overview of how this unidirectional flow works, because otherwise you'll ask me about it. Um, uh, air comes down the trachea in a bird and bypasses openings to the lung, the initial openings, and goes back into the, the caudal openings, the side closer to the tail, and then fills up the caudal sacs with fresh air. And at that same time that those caudal sacs are expanding, the, uh, the anterior air, air sacs are expanding and drawing air from the, the stale air from the lung into them. And when the animal breathes out, those sacs compress, uh, and the air from the caudal sacs goes through the lung, and the air from the cranial sacs and in the lung goes out of the animal. 
So at some point, there was a common ancestor of these two lung designs. Some extinct Permian amniote about 350 million years ago with an unknown lung. What led um, one, uh, what led this lineage, the bird lineage, to develop this, the unidirectional lung versus the tidal lung that we see in mammals? So what about the reptiles that we see today? Because these Permian ancestors are probably somewhat similar, and reptiles exist inside the family tree between mammals and, uh, and uh, extant birds. So reptile lungs come in many different designs. You can see um, there's a, uh, chameleons have a really a lot weird one with these long things that come as snakes, unsurprisingly, have a big long tube. But they were always assumed to have tidal airflow like mammals. However, um, we've discovered that uh, many of these lungs actually have unidirectional flow like birds, especially in, we've looked in crocodilians, we've looked in iguanas, and we've looked in monitor lizards. So reptile lungs deserve a much closer look in terms of answering this question and explaining these stories. Um, and we've kind of, the things we've done in the past to test this out, is we've taken dual thermistor heated flow probes and stuck them into lungs and how the animals breathe or pump air in and out, and we can observe which direction the air flows. And it's a crude method that allows us to get into some of the bigger chambers of the lung. Um, and I'm going to focus on this talk on monitor lizards, trying to explore more of the airflow, which is kind of the bulk of my PhD research. So monitor lizards are athletes in the reptile world. Here's a Komodo dragon chasing a deer, and they can actually catch them sometimes. So they're terrifying six foot long, eight foot long lizards, and there were bigger ones in the Pleistocene that were capable of eating even larger megafauna. Um, so they're athletes with very complex lungs. This is a lung I dissected out from a monitor lizard. All this pink stuff is blood vessels, and that's the heart. The heart is si situated right inside the lung and interacts with the lung in a really interesting way, which I don't have time to talk about. And here's a dried out lung. So remember in that bird lung, I showed you that there were the air sacs and there were the, the, plant, there were the, the, the tubes. This is not as developed in this animal, but here it's kind of where all the blood vessels and the lung exchange parenchyma is, and it's surrounded by these more balloony like air sacs. So they're a great group to study this, uh, this uh, lung because they're very specialized for um, uh, aerobic activity. And interestingly enough, the walls between the chambers are perforated. So here's a movie I made a few years ago, and I filled the lung up with water and embedded uh, microspheres into it and pumping the water. And it's hard to see in this room, but there are little beads, and they're moving unidirectionally across from one chamber into another chamber through these perforations of the walls. And here's a picture I've made of the inside of the lung with an endoscope. You can see the holes in there. Okay, so we've gained a superficial understanding that some unidirectional flow occurs in these animals, but we have no idea what's going on up here because we can't get in there with our crude techniques. So we're going to switch to... Uh, computer tomography and CFD modeling. So, right, we can get back to that. So I took a CT scan of many of these animals and I then segmented out the airways and you get a pretty good map of how the lung works. On the left is kind of um, all the airways of the lung. So there's like a, it, this represents where the air would be, not the walls. And in between all these chambers is a long tube that runs down from the trachea comes in here, that tube runs and it's, all these chambers are surrounding it. And you can see all these little holes around the lung. So they have an intrapulmonary bronchus surrounded by all these secondary bronchi. And remember, there's holes separating the walls between all these secondary bronchi. So we take our CT scan, our segmentation, we can make a surface model, then we can make a computational mesh, and then we just use uh, do CFD on that um, using an open foam. So Blue Waters makes this possible. Uh, I'll give you a little specifics of the model. We're using the open foam library, which is already still on open foam. Uh, native meshing softwares, uh, some dynamic solvers, which we modified um, to take uh, mod um, custom boundary conditions. And just, I've done, these, these models have about, about, about a million elements, and I run simulations up to 0 .0001 seconds for delta Ts, uh, and I've still got about 35,000 node hours left, which is pretty cool, so I can do more models. The way I make these work is I have a skin on the outside, it's like the wall of the lung, and then on the inside, I've rendered just the skeleton, the walls in there, and then I can separate these two boundaries so the skin can expand and contract, and the, and the inner side here, these static th things um, stay solid, and you can see the holes that represent the perforations in the walls. And I got the boundary conditions for the model actually from realistic lung motion. So this is an x-ray video of this animal breathing, and we kind of eyeballed how the lung was moving when it's breathing and applied it so that walls of the simulation are actually expanding and contracting. That's providing the boundary conditions. And we're modeling a resting tidal volume for this animal based on previous literature. Okay, to the results. So we have an interesting net unidirectional airflow pattern. 
So in that intrapulmonary bronchus, that tube that runs the whole length of the lung, that thing primarily brings air uh, caudally towards the back of the lung. Less air comes back through that tube than air goes forward. On the side chambers, more air comes forward than goes uh, back, which is pretty interesting. And to show you what that looks like on a real animal, that's this, that long tube here is primarily moving air to the back of the lung, and then the side chambers are primarily moving air forwards. A little bit of raw data, streamlines to show you what that looks like. So here I've colored the streamlines where blue is air uh, flow towards the left, towards the back of the lung, and red is t uh, flow towards the top. And the top I'm showing you kind of expiration, the animal's breathing out, and this is early, and then late inspiration. And what's really interesting is expiration looks like late inspiration. So the air flows um, essentially on, exp on inspiration down the, to the trachea and to the back of the lung. And also in those secondary chambers, it also flows to the back. But halfway through inspiration, that gets turned around and air starts flowing cranially. And then on expiration, air continues to flow cranially in the side chambers. So air flows in the same direction as expiration and late inspiration. So it's not a completely unidirectional lung. It's not a bird lung, but it's halfway there. So it's really kind of interesting to see this. And here's some quantitative analysis of the model showing what I mean. On the top are some flow rate graphs through that interpulmonary bronchus, where top is flow towards the back and the, uh, down is flow towards the, uh, the head. So in the, in the end of the pulmonary posterior bronchus, most of the air flow is happening towards the end. You're getting a little bit of reverse flow in, uh, during expiration, but not anywhere near as much. So this intrapulmonary bronchus is a net caudal transporter. And then I've taken some walls between the secondary bronchi to show you that these chambers are essentially net cranial transporters. And you can quantify that over a whole breath cycle. And I've scaled the arrows to show you relative motion. So for you know, a, a representative theory, like a, uh, for any 9.22 milliliters of air that move out of that chamber, um, you get 7.9 millimeters moving forward. For sort of, this is during expiration and inspiration. And the other thing that's kind of interesting to note is these arrows off the intrapulmonary bronchus show air directly flowing from the pulmonary bronchus into those side chambers. And the ones at the back of the animal are net out into the secondary bronchi, and the ones in the front are net in, into the intrapulmonary bronchus. That's the exact same pattern we see in the bird lung. Remember, on inspiration, air shot past the first four openings and then out into the lung in the last four openings, and then returned to the lung during, uh, from the cranial openings. And that's what's happening here. In the bird lung, we presume, because this actually, this kind of analysis has not been done on the bird lung, it might not be as clear cut as the literature would state, that there's no air moving the wrong way through these tubes. Whereas in the monitor, there are, there's air moving both directions. Airflow is tidal through those holes, but there's a net directionality to it. So it's, again, halfway towards the bird lung. Um, some more. I'll sh that's on my poster if you want to see it, but I'm not going to have time to look at it today. Okay, we validated these results on real lungs. And the way we did that is we had, um, we put some basically theater fog, which you would see uh, at, a, at a, I don't know, a dance party or something. And we went, put it into the lungs, and then we ventilated the lungs, and we stuck an endoscope in there and saw what direction the um, air was going. So here at spot number two, that's right here, you can, um, it was going back and forth. So here air was kind of coming in and out of that spot. That's a, a tidal spot. Here, whether I breathe, the animal's breathing in or out, I'm going to repeat these videos. Um, so this is the tidal one. Air is flowing one direction and then back the same way. And in this one, during inspiration and expiration, air is always flowing in the same direction. So some parts of the lung are unidirectional, some parts are tidal. And um, there's also some parts that show that weird reversal that I was mentioning, where the early part of inspiration flows one way, and then it goes back the other way. So expiration flows left to right. Inspiration starts going right to left, and then immediately switches back. And that's true of the one on the left as well, but I'm going to skip ahead. OK. And uh, I'm going to skip this video too. But this is essentially just showing the streamlines evolving over the breath cycle. And I got some kind of glitch on the top video. Blue is, again, uh, flow towards the back of the lung, and red is flow towards the front. So at the end of inspiration, you'll see flow starts to become net craniad. I have a cutoff. 
And then I mentioned also how um, air will kind of flow um, the, the, the openings from the intraporeal bronchus into the secondary bronchi are tidal. And you can see how they change over uh, the breath cycle. So in expiration, these are streamlines. Air is flowing out of those cranial secondary bronchi into the trachea and out of the animal. And then inspiration starts. It's going to start flowing into those and then move its way back as inspiration continues. And eventually, the streamlines are going to basically wrap around the caudal end of the lung and start um, causing cranial flow in the secondary bronchi. OK, I think I'm pretty much out of time, so I'm just going to show one other thing that's kind of interesting. And that is that the first secondary bronchus is really tidal. That's not like any of the other animals we've studied, where they all, the first one seems to be unidirectional in every species. But in, in this animal, the first t um, tube takes air in and then takes air up out the same way. And that might be a specialization to maximize ventilation of all, this, um, all the capillary beds at the top of the animal. So when you, uh, top of the lung. So if you got fresh air getting dumped into that region, especially during small breaths, intermittent breaths, it wouldn't have to work its way all the way around from the, uh, the whole back of the lung if you just get there directly. OK. So I showed that already. So we kind of see that monitors have this hybrid tidal and unidirectional lung, where maybe this lung represents some sort of intermediate design between a basal lung and the uh, kind of the bird design. So our key question, uh, why do um, each lineage develop a different pulmonary system? We can kind of see how that might have happened. But in terms of why, what biological traits are associated with which direction, we're still kind of agnostic. So future directions are going to be comparing lung airflow patterns across different monitor lizards. There's about 50 of these species. They vary in different habitats, body sizes, activity rates. And I have CT scans from about 25 of them that are collected in Australia. So the next step of the Blue Waters work is to be comparing across species and look for similarities and differences associated with um, habitats and lifestyles. And this is just a, a sneak peek to show how much variation in lung structure there is in, in this genus of lizards. Uh, and there's two more. So final outcomes, um, this stuff is being reviewed right now. Um, we're going to share a lot of this data on uh, Dryad and stuff once we publish it. And because biologists really still don't know how to use this technology, I started a YouTube tutorial for total beginners like me. And we kind of made some cool outreach images to teach kids and public how animals breathe working with a local animator. And those are my acknowledgments. Especially want to thank at Blue Waters Tom Cortese, Mark Van Moore, and Jay Hook Kwok for helping me out.